Hey everybody, I'm Dave with Focusrite Group Professional and today we're sitting with Jay Clark from Infrasonic and we're going to be talking about Dolby Atmos and Sony 360. So how long have you been working in immersive? Immersive, I would say, including surround, it's been 12 years because I, I work in film and um, television so I've been doing that for a long time but specifically music about four years. Was Dolby Atmos first for you or was it Sony 360? The story of the original room was that it was supposed to be Sony 360. And then I was like, ah, it would only be a few other speakers to you know, bring it up to Dolby spec. And at the time we wanted to uh, have a room for uh, home theater playback for features and stuff, you know, just like a smaller room where people could reference stuff. And um, so then I you know, added those other speakers having no idea that music stuff was coming. And then, uh, you know, that's how it ended up being. But it was, originally it was supposed to be 360. Now that you're doing everything because you not only mix in Dolby Atmos and you mix in Sony 360 and you're doing mastering. Now that you're at this place, do you have a favorite? Do you have something that you like better than others? And if so, why? Atmos, I prefer the room layout and sound and just placement stuff. It's a little more um, granular with where you place things. 360, I like the headphone, the binaural. Um, but that being said, in the 360, it's really nice. Um, it's a little easier to uh, do a mix quickly because small pan moves, because it's a sphere, uh, th throws things around. So it's like instantly immersive, whereas Atmos, you have to be a little more um, precise and kind of plan, you know, what, yeah. what's gonna happen. Something you said before that I wasn't aware of, and it, it keeps kicking in my head, that's why I'm bringing it up. I thought 360 had more speakers in the room than Dolby Atmos, but in the beginning it didn't. What was your first Sony setup? 13.1. It was 13.1. Mm -hmm. How many speakers do you have now for Dolby Atmos? Are you a 9.1.0? No, I'm a pro. I'm a pro. 11.1.6. <laughs> so you've got a pretty decent sized room then to have that much. Um, yeah, I mean the, the original room I was in was uh, I think 20... Five by 15. Uh, the room I'm in is a little bit smaller now, but the reason why I still like the um, 1116 is it keeps um, all the speaker placements familiar in that there's stereo here, left, right, right. So the phantom image that you're always trying to create if you're doing that is smaller than, and especially on the walls because from the wides to the first uh, side surround, it's like this. And then I have another one here. So instead of having one here and one here, and then you have to create that all the way down, I get a, a more granular, tighter image yeah. of things. And then it's the same on the ceiling. You know, they're stacked. So it's just, it, I feel like it works out where all the speakers are doing less work and you just get a little more detail. In case you're wondering what all the numbers dot what numbers are, we're referring to the different kind of uh, speaker layouts that you're gonna be using for either Atmos or for Sony 360. And we do have some other video content that's posted uh, and uploaded that you can refer to to get more information on that. You've been doing it now long enough. What are some of the pitfalls that you found? Let's start with Sony 360. Like, what are things that when people watch this, they're gonna wanna know? It's easier now because of the uh, standalone software. But I would say, with uh, Sony 360, you should do the mix, make the stems. If you have, you should have, if you're working in it, a surround room. I like to do like a static 7-1 mix. Plan for what I might want to put in the ceilings, maybe print some reverbs and stuff. Know ahead of time. Do all that, commit it. Then use their software to start placing stuff around because it doesn't, you know, it's still pretty new and it's, uh, it needs a lot of uh, CPU power. So if you are doing uh, heavy plug-in stuff, the delay compensation can get off a little bit and things can start to slip. So you, just have, you wanna be careful with that. Or if you're gonna do that stuff first, freeze all your tracks with the, the plugins before you print and the, you know, it'll be a little tighter. That actually sounds like insanely good advice. Yeah. So how about for uh, Dolby Atmos? What have you seen that's a pitfall that you've figured out a way to fix it or get around it? The pitfall would be the um, binaural versus the room versus the Apple Spatial. To get around it, in all honesty, is just time and playing with it. There are a lot of tricks I could give, and I'll give one in specific. So let's say you have a, a vocal and you like how it feels in the room, but you put on the headphones, you listen to binaural, and it's a little too quiet. You turn up the room, and you're like, it's too much, it's sticking out. You know, people really worry about, you know, because it's, when it's mono, it feels like it sticks out too much. So one thing you could try 
is using the size parameter and just a couple clicks from zero to two and the headphones will feel like a dB and a half. And so using the size as almost like an extra volume control for the binaural is a good trick to keep the mix in the room feeling the way you want, but adjust it. I'm headphones. super stealing that. Don't, don't tell anyone. Oh shit. I'm not stealing <laughs> it. No one's stealing it. I'm stealing it. Yeah. Man, thank you so much for coming by. This has been great. Thanks for having me. Again, Jay Clark, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Check us out for more video content and hit like. I don't know what I'm supposed to say to end this, so what do you want me to say to end this? Subscribe. That's great. <laughs>